My name is Tseho Khailai. Welcome back to another episode of My Lawyer's Corner. If you are returning to My Lawyer's Corner, welcome back and thank you for returning to My Lawyer's Corner. If you're a first time visitor on My Lawyer's Corner, welcome to My Lawyer's Corner. Here on My Lawyer's Corner, we share legal tips, legal nuggets, information on South African law to help you know your rights and know your law better, know your country better. Because when we know better, we do better. Um, just a disclaimer before we start. Information shared on my lawyer's corner is purely for information purposes only and is not to be construed to be legal advice. If you are facing a situation or circumstances that are relevant to the information shared on my lawyer's corner, I still maintain that you should seek legal advice from a professional attorney in order to um, get the relevant advice that would be relevant to you. Um, I am an admitted attorney in the Republic of South Africa. I have been an admitted attorney since the 25th of May 2015. That makes me <laughs> almost nine years post-admission. So on my lawyer's corner, we share information relevant to South African law, particularly labor law, criminal law, here and there, some company law, but I haven't um, yet recorded any episodes on company law. But for now, um, labor law definitely and some criminal law. In fact, today's episode is around criminal law and the elements of an offense. I'll also do like a small story time about um, when I was a criminal defense attorney. Um, and yeah, maybe that just for interest sake. So today's episode, without further ado, uh, I thought it would be interesting to talk about the elements of a criminal offense. Do you ever wonder when someone is charged, arrested and charged and brought to court, what must the state prove in order for them to get to a conviction of someone? Well, every offense has elements that the state would need to prove in order to arrive at a conviction um, against an accused person. So specifics vary from offense to offense, but the main elements of an offense throughout offenses are generally four main elements that the state would need to prove. The first being conduct on the part of the accused. Conduct means an act or an omission. An act means a positive act on the part of an accused to do something. An omission means a failure of the accused person which results in a criminal offense. Right, a failure to act, a failure to do something, an omission. Uh, you don't do something, but it results in a criminal offense. The second element that needs to be proven would be unlawfulness on the part of the accused person. The act that has been, or the, the conduct to the act on the part of the accused person has to be unlawful. It has to be against the law. It has to be prohibited by the law which makes it unlawful. The third element that needs to be proven is intent on the part of the accused person, either intention or negligence. So these two, intention or negligence, are termed fault, the legal term that is used to, to, to qualify the intent and the negligence is called fault on the part of the accused person. And the last um, element that needs to be proven is the causation. As a result of the actions of the accused person, the unlawful um, result has been caused by his conduct, right? So those are the four main elements of um, an offense. And from offense to offense, it, the, the four elements remain um, necessary Sorry. Sorry about that. The four elements need to be proven in order for a criminal offense to have been or to have occurred, right? Let's look at the offense of murder. And I choose murder because it's part of the story that I will share 
that um, happened when I was in practice. So A murders B in cold blood, shoots him, and A is then arrested for murder and brought to the regional court of South Africa and is charged with murder. What does the state need to prove, right? The state would need to prove that there is conduct, so there's an act that occurred. So the act is that A shoots B. That's the act. The act needs to be unlawful. It is against the law for you to take the life of someone else, right? The state would need to prove fault on the part of A. Fault can either be intention or negligence. Now, depending on the circumstances of what happened when A shot B, let's say A knowingly woke up in the morning, took his gun, went to B's house and shoots B. There is a clear, direct intent on A's part to shoot B, causing the loss of his life, right? And just as I've touched on it, causation would need to be proven in that the causal link between the loss of B's life and the act on behalf of A, or the act committed by A, so the loss of life, the loss of B's life was caused directly by A's conduct. And that is causation, the causal link, the nexus between the act and the resultant loss of life. So back when I was in <laughs> practice, back when I was in practice, I think this happened in 2017, I was I was a private I was a private attorney back then. And um I represented this client who had been arrested for the murder of his supervisor. And um, he shot his supervisor at work, cold blood. And there was a video footage. There was video footage of him shooting his supervisor in cold blood. Um, the worst part about um, how he shot his supervisor, when you see the footage, is that he fired one shot the supervisor collapsed to the floor while lying down he shot another shot and then he proceeds to exit the premises but returns several seconds later and while the supervisor is visibly um, unconscious uh, lying down on the floor on the ground he fires two more shots and this all happens within the employment um, context, within the, the, the premises of the employer. And um, when we went to court, his instruction to me was that he's pleading not guilty, which is his right. He's pleading not guilty. Remember, attorneys advise clients and clients instruct attorneys. At no point should it ever be that an attorney is instructing a client to plead guilty. Right. And I advised him based on the evidence that was in the docket against him that the, this case, this, the case that the state has against him was strong because there's eyewitnesses, there's eyewitness statements, there's a video footage. So there's quite strong direct evidence that links him to the commission of the crime, which he's not necessarily denying. He's just denying <laughs> causing the offense so his his explanation was that he did not intend to kill um his supervisor who's now late he didn't intend to kill him it's just that the supervisor pushed him um or instigated an argument or a feeling in him that resulted in him ending up pulling the trigger um and the, the thing, up, the, the intricate thing about this, this case was the fault, um, the element of fault, because the conduct was there, the unlawfulness was there, and the causal link was there. The fault as to whether this was intentional or unintentional or negligent, um, it was very clear. And from the, the way I've just explained to you, so what happened let me explain how it happens. They work in a tire shop. Um, they worked in a tire shop and 
my client, the accused, was um, one of the general workers in the tile shop and his supervisor, um, him and his supervisor didn't quite get along, right? And um, they'd, they'd often have arguments, they'd often have disagreements at work and in some way or another this pushed my client to come to work with a firearm. Now he wakes up in the morning, packs his bag to go to work and packs his firearm in his backpack, right? This is where if I had been the magistrate in that matter, and I wasn't the magistrate, I was I was my client. And these are the things that I use to explain to my clients um, from a perspective of what the court is going to hear, what the court is going to see. And, and especially when the evidence is that strong against my client. Um, mine was to basically explain and advise what the case against him looked like and what the magistrate would likely ask. So he woke up in the morning, he packed his bag to go to work and packs his firearm because he continuously has arguments with his supervisor. He gets to work, the work day begins and not long into the work day, an argument ensues between him and his supervisor. And what does he do in order to um, retaliate to the argument, he pulls out his gun. And what does he do? He shoots. So under those circumstances, the question, the question becomes whether provocation was such that um, the accused person had no other option out but to react in the way that he did. And the answer is simply no. You can't bring a gun to a first fight and expect not to be ex not to um, appear to be the aggressor in the situation right and just as I had advised my client or cautioned my client he was indeed found guilty of murder and um, we are in South Africa we don't do murder in the first degree or like we we, we do premeditated murder and non-premeditated murder. So he was found guilty for non guilty of non-premeditated murder under those circumstances and sentenced to 10 years direct imprisonment. Remember, all factors need to be taken into account when arriving at a suitable sentence, such as um, any mitigating factors, any aggravating factors, um, aggravating factors being the factors that make the, the, the offense worse, the circumstances or the resultant the resultant circumstances post the commission of the offense worse. And mitigating factors are those that make it better. Oh, sorry, I have a visitor. Yes, so sorry about that. That's what happens when you are a mother to a toddler. And um, yeah, so... Basically, those are the elements that need to be proven in order for the murder to have been proven to have occurred. And in his circumstances, while the fault was in question, um, the facts of the matter show that indeed he acted with direct intention to cause the loss of life on the part of his supervisor. And those are the factors that led to him being found guilty and being subsequently sentenced to 10 years direct imprisonment. And I think that was the longest sentence that I have ever <laughs> been dealt. But I always say you are not your client and um, some cases are just not there for you to win. Um, I used to thrive on acquittals and um, section 174 discharges, but not every not every case is not every case is there for you to win. And that's the reality of um, having been a criminal defense attorney. Um, best days of my life, tempted to return, um, tem very tempted to return back to litigation and who knows, watch the space. I could very well be making my return. 
but those are the elements of an offense which need to be proven in order for the state to arrive at a conviction and to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, to prove a prima facie case, actually, they need to prove that all the elements are present um, in order to arrive at a possible conviction. My name is Tsoko Khailai, and I hope that you have learned a thing or two from this episode of My Lawyer's Corner. Please remember to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Uh, share your views. We share our views in a very respectful manner, um, noting that each one of us is here to learn from one another. I will see you on my next episode of My Lawyer's Corner.